What's going on, everybody? Andrew Thompson here, the Andrew Thompson Interviews YouTube channel. Got a very special guest joining the channel today. He is one of Iowa's favorite sons. He's a former AAW heavyweight champion. This is Merrick Brave. Oh, yeah, also, not to mention, forgot to mention, he is also a co-trainer at the uh, the head trainer, one of the head trainers at the Black and Brave Wrestling School in Davenport, Iowa. This is one Merrick Brave. Merrick, how you doing today, Chief? Hey, thanks for having me in, Andrew. I appreciate Excited you. to be here. I appreciate you taking the time, man. I've all, I've always wanted to speak to you. You know, I've always heard your name. And, you know, I, like, I, I didn't, I started, I first came across independent wrestling probably maybe a few years after 2003 because, I, you know, I, I was only aware of WWE and TNA wrestling at the time, and that's when I started sure. branching out and discovering certain stuff. And I always heard your name and stuff, so it was always cool. It's, a, it's cool to finally get, get a chance to be able to speak to you. Uh, for, firstly, just to start us off here, man, what have you been up to for the past uh, seven months uh, since oh. – <laughs> since the COVID-19 pandemic uh, started. Well, you know, Iowa's rules have been a little bit more relaxed than other states. So, you know, still trying to stay safe and as healthy as possible. But um, mm -hmm. we took a few weeks off from training just to see kind of where things were at um, so that we could implement new protocols, new cleaning standards, new safety measures, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Uh, and then we got right back to it. So uh, as far as training has gone, nothing has changed uh, too much, at least with our schedule. Um, I also run a local independent promotion called SCW Pro. Um, we're getting ready to celebrate our 17-year anniversary. Actually, wow. we've technically already celebrated it, but the show had some issues. We had to move it back a month. So we actually have a show this upcoming Saturday on the 19th to celebrate our 17-year anniversary. But that'll probably be the last one we do uh, in front of a live audience for a while, just because we're not doing shows indoors right now. That feels a little riskier than doing shows outdoors so we've been able to line up some shows for uh throughout the summertime uh, as far as outdoor events go but once that uh once that weather turns south here in <laughs> iowa pretty soon we won't be able to do that anymore so we're working on right. some things to bring uh, some some brand new content online for our fans and hopefully new fans all across the world uh since it'll be online and and we'll see where that goes but you know, just I guess I've been doing the same thing as everybody else, just trying to stay as safe and as healthy as possible and mm -hmm. take care of the people around me and, and lean on the people around me. Uh, and we're getting through. We're surviving. So we'll see where it goes from you. Right, right, right. And, and I feel like like it's normally, like I say over the past two years or so, I feel like people regularly associate you with being the, the you know, the head trainer of the Black and Bay Wrestling <laughs> Academy. But at the same time, you did have a very successful, I think a very successful career in professional wrestling, a decade plus decade plus in, in professional wrestling like just for you when, when did you start to notice like the the shift in wrestling as far as like you know wrestlers injuries being taken more seriously and the performances health being pushed to the forefront opposed to the overall you know overall feel of the show like when did you start to notice that shift or was it more so of a collaborative effort between the wrestlers and the promoters I think that's a great question because uh you know even even when I was being trained in 2003 and 2004 mm -hmm. there was a a pretty old school mentality regarding stuff like that, specifically like concussions and things where, uh, you know, you kind of got that if you were complaining about something like that. And it was, you know, and I played high school football and it was the same there. So it's not even just the wrestling industry, but we as a society have collectively uh, realized how uh, dangerous things like that can be uh, brain injuries and such. So I think we're all taking it a little bit more seriously, but, I mean, wrestling's a contact sport. Uh, injuries yeah. happen all the time. I suffered my fair share of them, including a, a pretty severe neck injury that, that kind of derailed my in-ring career and, and allowed me to focus more on, on the coaching. So I guess it was kind of a blessing in disguise. But, uh, you know, there was – I took a little bit of time off in, like, 2010, uh, 2011, and came back. Uh, towards the end of 2011 and just in that short amount of time I would say maybe a year a year and like three four months uh, the conversation around injuries and specifically concussions and things had shifted and and people were taking them more seriously and the fans were causing the wrestlers and the promoters and and everyone involved in the business to take it more seriously I remember coming back and doing a match um, where I got, I don't know if it was a chair shot or I think it might have been a stop sign and I got hit in the head 
and I didn't, I, I didn't put a hand up because, okay. you know, like I said, I come, I come from that old school generation of, of professional wrestling trainers that, you know, are like, Hey man, you know, prove how tough you are. Don't put a hand up. And so that's just how I was taught coming up in the business. And so I don't, I didn't put a hand up. And I remember getting on Twitter after the match and like the people who were there were very upset saying that it was unsafe and, and uh, you know, I should set a better example to, to future wrestlers coming up. And like, I remember just being like flabbergasted, like, Whoa, what's going on? These people right. want me to put a hand up, you know, usually you would get chastised for something like that, but it was, it was weird. I was like, wow, the fans, actually care about the performer's safety now as opposed to even just a year and a half prior where you would have been booed for putting a hand up so I, I guess I would say it was probably about a decade ago where it seemed like um that mentality shifted a little bit so I mean it's still a it's still a difficult uh business to break into and you still have to be tough mentally and physically yeah. to break into it but uh, I think it's nice that uh, people are caring about other people's health and safety a little bit more now. And that goes for fans, promoters, fellow wrestlers alike. So I think it's a great thing. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that because uh, I was recently listening to an interview that Ken Anderson did. And he was just talking about like that, that being trained by that old school uh, type of trainer, that mentality. Cause I remember he specifically talked about the, the chair shot that he took from the undertaker at, at survivor series in the early two thousands. And he was just talking about how he was trained as to like, you know, he, he wouldn't like it. It, it, it. it would be more hurtful, quote unquote, to him if somebody were to hit him with a chair and they were to do it in a weak manner. Like sure. basically saying, like, if you're going to do it, do it. Like, don't, bring it, right? Yeah, right yeah. Exactly. Don't hold back. And that, like, just, just knowing like that, that's how some of you guys that, that are still around today to this very day, like, that's how you would train. It's kind of like, it, it's crazy in comparison to now, because like, I'm pretty sure now most of us, they would tell you like immediately if you see a yeah. chair coming your way, block it, block it out. Cause and yeah, I think it's, you know, we made those mistakes so that the future people coming up don't have to make those mistakes, you know, because I remember feeling that way coming into the business, like, oh, you never put a hand up. You always bring it. Uh, you know, if you get hit, you get hit the old cliche. It's not ballet, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but now I teach my students, you know, because I've suffered many, many concussions. Uh, throughout the years and I've done my research on CTE and whatnot and I realize it's a serious issue um, but I tell my students coming up now I'm like listen if somebody's gonna kick you in the face or in the back of the head or hit you with a weapon or whatever it may be put a hand up get it in there because first of all it's gonna help you uh, with your safety and your health going forward but it's also realistic you know what I mean like you yeah. watch people watch MMA right so if somebody's going to punch you in the face, what's the first thing they do is they, they, cover, they, up. they cover up, you know, mm -hmm. nobody wants to be hit in the head. So it's <laughs> realistic that you would try and block something from hitting you in the head or the face or whatever it may be. Right. So it, it doesn't actually, you know, quote unquote, expose the business like we were taught. It actually helps the business because it makes things a little bit more realistic, at mm -hmm. least in my opinion. So nah. we do uh, at the Black and Brave Wrestling Academy, we, we do teach our students, hey, put a hand up. Make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Make sure you're taking care of your opponent. Safety is the most important thing because, you know, 95% of independent wrestlers don't make their living off of pro wrestling. They have to go to a job Monday through Friday to pay the bills. But if you're hurt and you're injured, not only can't you wrestle, but you also can't go to your regular job and earn your income uh, so that you can survive. So there's really no point in being overly stiff or overly unsafe um, just to get a slightly better reaction mm -hmm. if you even do so. Yeah. I, I, that, that last part that you mentioned, I think that was especially important because I think that's the part we as fans kind of miss out on as well as specifically speaking about independent wrestling is like there, there, there are some who are able to, they always have the benefit of, you know, specifically focusing solely on pro wrestling, but there's a great majority that do have that outside job and like, that, that, that's kind of very easy to forget about from my perspective, like just noticing that some of these people, they do have to have, you know, just those outside jobs just to, you know, for, further push their dream forward. So I think that was a, you know, a good point that you mentioned. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier when we first started that you were a former AEW heavyweight champion. Of course, that promotion is owned by Danny Daniels and he trained you, correct? Am I, am I correct in saying yep. that? Yes, he, he did. You. So, so like, what, what, what was it like, you know, basically 
competing for someone that did train you and then at the same time knowing that AEW is still going strong to this day. I know Danny Daniels has kind of been teasing on social media that they're going to have their, uh, their restart very soon, which is cool to see. Uh, but like, yeah. what, what, like what, what was it like to just know that that promotion that you, you and many, many others started in, um, you know, that, that, that is still going strong today? Well, I do take pride in that. Um, we were trained by Danny. He didn't own AAW at the time of training us, but he, right. he got us into the promotion, myself and, and Seth, when he was known as Tyler Black. Uh, he got us into the promotion. Uh, basically, my first, I had been wrestling since August of 2003, but I didn't get formally trained. I did a lot of like day camps and different things mm -hmm. to learn how to bump and do all the different moves. And I was performing on, on shows. Uh, but my first fully trained professional wrestling match actually was for AAW and it was against Danny Daniels. And, and <laughs> he's the reason that that match happened because uh, he saw a lot of potential in me and he wanted to be my first match there. Mm -hmm. uh, and we went out there and we had a good one. And, and, you know, my persona and my character and my standing within the company just grew from there. Uh, and so did uh, Tyler. So did Seth. And uh, we actually ended up having a really, um, at the time, a, a very uh, heated rivalry with each other uh, in storyline. And, you know, kind of outside of storyline a little bit, too, just because we always wanted to one-up each other and, and be the one that yeah. had the better matches and, and so on and so forth. And, and people will laugh. They watch this. But Danny Daniels always said I was better than him <laughs> until I had my neck injury. So... Uh, maybe maybe it'd be called the Brave and Black Wrestling Academy, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know we had a we had an awesome feud for the AAW Heavyweight Title uh, after he had turned on me as my tag team partner. That's kind of a running theme with him, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, it it was a year long feud that was built perfectly. Uh, the fans were chomping at the bit to see us finally uh, collide and when we eventually did it was in a no roped barbed wire match which was something that was unheard of at that time for two mm -hmm. people who weren't deathmatch wrestlers you know we were young kids we were good looking dudes long hair you know good physiques all that stuff we weren't deathmatch wrestlers so for us to do no roped barbed wire uh, that was an incredible spectacle at that time and it was the first time that AAW had a sold out show we sold out the world famous Berwyn Eagles Club, yeah. uh, and and that was the first time that ever happened. So I they, do. They still feel run like, that venue. Yeah. Uh, from time to time, I know yeah. Shimmer still still runs there. AEW's kind of branched out into a couple different spots, but mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, when I look back on that, I do feel like that was kind of a de defining moment for the company, and and I am proud of the fact that they're still going strong today, and I, I feel like the work that myself and and Seth did back in the day helped put them on the map and helped get them more attention and helped lead them to where they are now, you know, and there's been many other wrestlers who have come through uh, those curtains and performed at a very high level for AAW. So I don't want to take anything away from them because they played their, their part too. But uh, mm -hmm. I do feel like Seth and I were probably the first that uh, were able to do that and help put them on the map. So yes, we're both very proud of that. Yeah, I, I think that's fair to say. Like even now, like I see um when I see AEW, they post some of like their throwback uh throwback uh co cover show photos, and like I will always see you or or Seth Rollins on the cover. Like it, that's always cool to see. Like just seeing how far both of you guys have come, which is very cool. But like, one one thing I really did want to ask you, man, like what what was it like uh you know c coming up in the Iowa independent wrestling scene? Like what, what like what was that like? What I'm sure that was well, like kind of difficult when, to come up in, like as far as exposure wise. Yeah, when, when I first started wrestling, there wasn't really an independent scene in Iowa. The first <laughs> company I wrestled for, which is now the company that I run, SCW, oh, okay, right, right. excuse me, was uh, started by a bunch of high school kids in a makeshift ring in a barn. Uh, you know, I was a fan of the company before I joined, and we used to have to, I think it was like $2 admission. We'd pay 2 bucks. And we'd have to walk through the lower level of this barn and then climb a ladder to get to the upper level of the barn where the makeshift ring was located. And we'd sit there and we'd watch these, you know, other high school kids basically do backyard wrestling. But, you know, at 15 years old, 16 years old, I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And I knew I wanted to do it. So there wasn't really an independent scene in Iowa 
at the time. Uh, shortly after, SCW was able to purchase a real professional wrestling ring from High Spots. It was delivered to a church. Um, we had kind of like conned them a little bit into being like, oh, this is a high school wrestling group. Uh, and, and we do this so that we stay off the streets and we stay out of trouble and whatnot. But we just needed a place to set up a ring yeah. <laughs> and learn how to do all the things that we wanted to do in an actual wrestling ring. Uh, so it worked and we got the ring delivered there. And the first day we got it, we all set it up. There was probably 20 of us there. And we, there was one guy who had gone to Chicago. His name was Snake Eyes Mike Andrews. Um, Nobody's probably ever heard of him, but he's from Iowa. He went to Chicago first, got trained out of all of us first. And he came back and he showed us how to bump and run the ropes and, you know, do suplexes and body slams and all that stuff. And by the end of the eight hours I was in there that day, you know, Seth was on the top rope doing Phoenix splashes. I was on the top rope doing shooting star presses. And, and uh, that was our first day in an actual professional wrestling ring. So that was pretty wild. That was August or maybe late July of 2003. And then we had our first real event with a real ring and a real audience and, and all of that in, in August of 2003. So that was the first time I had ever wrestled in front of a, a live crowd. So it was cool. But shortly after that, a company called 3XW, which I later went on to do a lot of good stuff with, um, you know, kind of my home away from home, uh, AAW and then 3XW. Uh, but they kind of, they formed on the other side of the state uh, in Des Moines, and and they started doing independent shows, and they're still running today. Uh, and then IPW was kind of an independent promotion in the middle of Iowa, like the, the southern parts. Um, but they didn't get a lot of exposure, and and I actually did my first paid match for them, which maybe like a year later after, mm. like summer of 2004. I thought that was super cool. Um, but there really wasn't an independent scene in Iowa, and now you look at it, there's probably five or six different promotions running in Iowa and a lot of our black and brave graduates uh, work on those shows and, and are doing great things for them. And I think the Iowa independent scene is thriving right now. You know, we may not get the same publicity as AAW does or GCW does or PWG out in California, but we've been going strong for almost two decades now. Uh, I have no plans to shut down shop. So We'll see where it goes from here, but I'm proud of the legacy we've created uh, for independent professional wrestling here in Iowa. All right, and, and you know, you, you mentioned uh, some of your Black and Brave uh, student graduates. Like, but but first, firstly, before we get to that, I did want to ask you, like, like, is it just crazy to you, like, sit, like you ever sit back and just think about how far the Iowa wrestling scene has come? Like, you, like as you mentioned, there really wasn't one when you guys first started, and now it is four or five different promotions there. Like you ever just sit back and look and just look at it like, damn, like, like this is like, yeah, <laughs> it is. It really is crazy. Uh, who knows what would have happened if, if Seth and I hadn't branched out and done our own thing. I think a lot of people were inspired by the things we were doing over on the Eastern side of the state. Uh, and that, you know, made them think, Hey, maybe we'll open a promotion here in our hometowns, but yeah, it's pretty wild. Uh, hopefully it continues to thrive and, and get bigger and get stronger. And um, we'll be able to do this for years to come. But but I was I was not a bad place to be for indie wrestling. And we're close <laughs> enough to other hot spots like Chicago and right. Minnesota and Kansas City and St. Louis. And so it, it really isn't a bad spot to be. And one, one guy I did want to talk to you about was uh, one, one Mr. Zicky Dice. Uh, Z sure. Z Z Zicky is hilarious, man. Like, very, 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 very charismatic dude. And that, that just seemed like that's just him in general. Like, what what is it like for you to see him? You know, of course, he went on to win the NWA national television title. And I think he's still with the NWA as of right now. But, like, just seeing him kind of just have this break. Because I, 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 I never seen Dick Zicky Dice before. Yeah, I saw him more in NWA Power. And when I saw him by like, a couple of weeks, I'm like, this dude is hilarious, man. I see why they keep bringing him back. Oh, yeah. Him back. So, like, what, like is he, was he always like that when you guys first? Uh, yeah, from day one, <laughs> you know, he was in a in a, a pretty successful band and still is yeah, yeah, um, right. before arriving. So he always kind of had that stage presence about him, and he was always uh, quite the entertainer, uh, sometimes to a fault. I remember uh, <laughs> he, he might get mad at me for telling this story, but he'll get over it. I remember uh, coming to the end of his class, uh, there was one day where he just, I don't know if he was in a mood or he wasn't feeling it or whatnot. 
Uh, but we were having practice matches that day, and he just decided to goof off during his entire practice match. And he didn't take it seriously, and he didn't try hard. Uh, and he thought it was funny, and, you know, a couple of his classmates thought it was funny. But I didn't think it was very funny. You know, I might have been having a bad day, too. And I, I pulled him aside. Actually, I didn't even pull him aside. I just called him out in front of everybody and told him that he was being lazy, he was being a fool, and that if he continued to act that way, he'd never have a future in professional wrestling. But then he made a, a full-on career of being a fool, so I was wrong on that. But uh, <laughs> uh, And he got, he got mad, and he yelled back at me. And, you know, as a head coach, I'm not going to take uh, any signs of disrespect from anyone, so I yelled back at him. Uh, and then eventually it got – he did so much that I kicked him out of class, but on his way out, he decided to do a little chirping. So I followed him outside and I was like, you need to get out of here. And he, he pushed me and I pushed him back and we came very close to getting into a fist fight uh, right outside of the doors of our, our training facility at the time. Uh, thankfully that didn't happen and, and cooler heads prevailed. Uh, and he, you know, called to apologize later in the evening and, and, you know, everything was cool after that. And he ended up graduating and he stuck around for a little while and then went off and did his own thing. And he's achieved some, some pretty good success for himself. And, mm -hmm. and I'm very proud of him. Yeah. And, and, and to just let you know, just as of recent interviews that I've seen Ziggy Dice, he speaks very highly of yourself and, and both. Oh yeah. Lives. We very, talk all the time. That, highly, that's yeah. so far. That's so long ago. That's completely water under the bridge. We're cool now. He'll text me and call me for advice, you know, basically once a week. That's and, good. and yeah. you know, we we keep in touch, and, and he's doing great things. I'm very, very proud of him. And, and another guy I did want to talk to you about who's just having, like, a breakout. Like, it, it's, it's crazy because he's having, like, a breakout 2020 in this area of wrestling that we're in right now is Benjamin Carter. Like, he's doing, like, yeah, some absolutely. crazy good. Like, I, I've seen him the GCW, uh, Black Label Pro. Uh, I know he's doing some stuff on AEW Dark right now, and there's been people on social media who've been seeing his stuff and calling for AEW to sign him. Like, and he like he, he has this, like, smoothness in the ring to him. Like, I, like I kind of compare it to, like, um like like Isaiah Scott in NXT or, like, a Cedric Alexander. Like, those guys sure. just kind of have this, like, real – smoothness like the way they move around the ring like yeah. just just seeing what Benjamin Carter is doing right now man seeing the ascension that he's having at such a quick rate like it, I, I know that got to make you proud oh yeah absolutely Ben uh has always been uh just a natural in the ring just his movements his timing his pacing uh his ability to to turn on the jets in a split second and and uh you know accelerate and decelerate and just it's really impressive you know when Seth and I were coming up we were like the high flyers of the of the Midwest region and sometimes I'll see Ben at training or even just kind of messing around in the ring before training and he just pulls off a sequence of things that like blows my mind I don't even understand how he's able to do it and I'll look over at Seth and I'll be like man we thought we were the high flyers coming up we couldn't <laughs> do you know 25 percent of what this guy can do so <laughs> He's he certainly has a bright future. Uh, I think he's got a couple different avenues and a couple different places that are kind of pursuing his talents right For now. Sure. So I'm not yeah. gonna I'm not gonna give anything away. You know, mm -hmm. I talked to him this morning, and it seems like there's some some very big things in the works for him. Again, I couldn't be more proud, and uh, I'm excited to see where he goes. He's still so young. He's 22 years old. Crazy. Um, yeah. You know, he's got he's had an incredible journey. He's uh, a British citizen. He's actually from Jersey uh, on the Channel Islands, which is a chain of islands in between England and France, um, which is a territory of England. So he has a very thick British accent, um, but we always joke with him that he's he's French and he's not British since the <laughs> islands are closer to France. He gets real mad about that. But And, and he just says the weirdest stuff because he's from England. Mm. We were talking about uh, tattoos one day, and he doesn't have any tattoos. And we asked him if he was going to get a tattoo. And he's like, well, I don't know, mate. I'd have to feel, <laughs> I'd have to feel real comfortable to get some of those scribbly doodahs. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so he's a crazy cat, but super talented. Uh, and he's got a lot of fans in high places right now. So I For think sure. uh, you've just seen the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Ben Carter. Right. And you, and you mentioned the SCW promotion now in Iowa and you're the current on, on that promotion right the promotion owner yep right That's i own and i right. do some booking and, and different things but yeah 
So, so like, what, what has it been like for you kind of navigating your way to the eventual restart and like having shows during the pandemic? Like I know you mentioned you guys got a show on, the, uh, on September 19th. I'm sure, I'm sure it hasn't been anything easy to kind of navigate this whole process. No, but like, not at all. But like as you inch closer to that September 19th date, which is next weekend, I think, right? Yep. Yeah, next weekend. Like what, what has it been like for you to kind of navigate that process and, you know, basically, you know, on the road there to open it back it, up? It's certainly been a process. Uh, we did take... Gosh, our last our last event before the pandemic was like March seventh, and then that was when things were like news was kind of trickling out about how uh, yeah. how dangerous this could be. Uh, we had a show scheduled for the fourteenth, but I made the decision to cancel that one and just see kind of where we were going. Uh, unfortunately, as we know now, things didn't really get better, so we didn't have an event for you know, two to three months before the weather warmed up enough for us to get something going outside. Um, again, with very different restrictions, uh, social distancing, mandatory masks. Um, we've had to basically ban our wrestlers from high-fiving the fans on the way out, which mm -hmm. sucks to do, but it is, you know, for the benefit of everyone involved, the health and, and safety of the performers and the fans alike. Um, we've had to do a whole bunch of different things, but it's certainly been a task. And, and then the thing with, up, with these outdoor shows is that, you know, you're not just battling coronavirus or the pandemic, but you're also battling weather but, because right. you could have this outdoor show scheduled and you got people driving in or flying in from all over the country. And then all of a sudden the day happens and it's raining and you can't have an event. And then now you've lost X amount of dollars you know, due to transportation and flights and different things. And unfortunately you can't have an event when it's pouring down rain. So uh, we've had a lot of issues. We had, a, I'm, I'm not sure if you heard of it, but there was a essentially what they call a land hurricane in Iowa. I've lived mm. here since 1997. I've never seen anything like it, but it's called like a, a Dara show or a Dara show or something like that. But we had over a hundred an hour winds coming through wow. the Midwest. There was, uh, you know, trees, like giant trees just blown all over all the streets, all the roads, all the highways. There were overturned semis. It was pretty devastating. And, you know, unfortunately, that, that happened on a Monday. We had an event scheduled for that Saturday, uh, an outdoor event. But the venue sustained a whole bunch of damage. They didn't have power. They didn't have internet. We weren't able to have our event. Uh, and we, we had to postpone that one, too. So we had all this other stuff going on with the pandemic. And then we had mother nature, you know, kind of giving us the middle finger too. And it's just been a, a crazy year for pro wrestling, but we're pivoting to uh, some online content here pretty soon, brand new content. So people from all over the world can, can enjoy uh, some matches from the black and brave graduates. Um, we're working on some cinematic style matches, much like WWE has been doing. And, and uh, okay. you know, Matt Hardy kind of made famous with his yeah. stuff. So we're working on doing some of that stuff as well. I, I have a great team of editors and, and uh, camera people and all different types of stuff that are, are willing to help out. So we're, mm -hmm. we're trying what we can to, to stay alive and, and give that content to the fans. And, mm -hmm. you know, if that's, that's just what you have to do in 2020. If you're trying to survive, you're trying to, to make it through and hopefully we come out on the back end of this all right you know you gotta you gotta be willing to be a problem solver like i right. said pivot to different avenues of, of content creation and that's what we're trying to do so we'll see where it goes and, and, and you know as a promotion owner like what, what why do you think like the outside setting has been more like other uh, like one of the more favorable options in, in terms of running shows again like we've seen you know various promotions do the outside outside venue now like and i think that's like as you mentioned i think it's kind of more safer in a way opposed to having an arena or a building full yeah. of people like why, why do you think that's the case well you know you can distance yourself a little bit more outside you're not confined by walls um you're not trying to you know jam pack people in like sardines sitting two <laughs> inches from each other uh in their seats you're able to let people sit in clusters uh, we do a thing uh a bring your own chair event so we don't even provide the chairs for the fans. They get to bring their own folding chairs. Okay. So the group they came in with, they can find a spot on the grass, they can set up their chairs, and that's where they sit. We don't do rows of chairs. We don't do uh, anything like that. So you're able to pick and choose where you want to sit. 
you're in charge, you're in control of your uh, social distancing measures. We will enforce it if we feel like it's not being uh, followed properly. But the outdoor shows are definitely the way to go right now. It's difficult to run the indoor shows just because you're limited. There's, there's only so much space you can have, especially for an independent wrestling show where the venues aren't that large to begin with. So mm -hmm. um, I have a local venue and we had discussions about possibly trying to find a way we could do an indoor show. But at the end of the day, we just decided, you know, we'd have to basically allow no more than like 50 people in the building. But then for us to, to make money off of that, we'd have to double or triple ticket prices, which is something I don't want to do. No. Um, I don't feel comfortable asking fans to pay that much money for that. But then also the venue wouldn't have made a whole lot of money selling concessions, alcohol, no. um, you know, food and drink because there's only 50 people there and they can only consume so much. So we, we decided to table those discussions for now. Um, we'll see if there's something we can figure out over the next few months, but it's going to be a long, cold winter here in Iowa. <laughs> like it always is. And I'm not going to ask people to bundle up in parkas to go to an outdoor <laughs> wrestling show. So. Right. Right. And, and I, I remember, um, I think it was last, last year around this time. I mean, not last year around this time, but last year following WrestleMania, it was a few weeks out of WrestleMania. I know Seth Rollins came back uh, to, to the promotion and you guys had like a, a, a walk from home type of thing. And it, it, I, I remember I saw the video going around and, and it was cool just seeing like the reception that he got. And of course, seeing you there with him, like, I, I, I know that had to be one of just one of those cool retrospect type of moments, like, you know, both of you in, in this promotion that you run, him coming back uh, fresh off a, a WrestleMania, a big WrestleMania win and just seeing the both of you there. I, I know that had to be like just a real cool thing. Like, like yeah, we, we look, look how far we come, man. We, yeah, we that was pretty wild. I thought that was a really, we did a really good job of keeping that, a yeah, surprise yeah, to our fans. I, they had no, nobody knew. Nobody, nobody knew. knew, which was crazy because the house was still really good. The the crowd was was large for that, so they picked a good one to come to. <laughs> but uh, you know, I I think about that, and I remember soaking it all in in that moment. A lot of times when you're performing, even if it's just a a promo or whatnot, you kind of have like an out of body experience, and you don't uh, you don't have like very vivid memories of of what happened. But I remember taking a step back and just soaking in everything that was happening and realizing that there was a good chance that was the last time we would ever be in a room together on a show in front of an audience. Uh, we had done that so many times before in front of that audience, SCW, mm -hmm. but many audiences uh, across the country. And I, I thought to myself, this could be it. This could be the last time. Um, so it was, it was definitely a very special moment for both of us, very special moment for our fans, a very special moment for all the, the guys and gals in the back to be able to see like, oh man, here he is. Like, like they know him, you know, he trains right. them. He's there right. all the time. He gives them advice all the time, watches their matches, critiques their matches, everything. Uh, but they got to see, oh wait, you know, we always watch him wrestle on TV or we always watch him wrestle on WWE Network. But now we get to see him in a ring that we'll be performing in later in the night. I think it, it was a good opportunity for them to see, you know, you have an opportunity. You have a chance. You can make it someday. He was right here exactly. just like everybody else. Right. You know, at that point, 16 years ago, seven, 15, 16 years ago. And now he's on WrestleMania every year, you know, multi-time WWE champion, uh, you know, one of the most – famous professional wrestlers in the world and he came from this promotion right here scw and, and mm -hmm. here we go on into the future who knows who else will be able to say that going forward you know can it, I, will it be a ben carter will it be yeah. you know <laughs> someone else say hey i used to wrestle for scw now here i am uh, a multi-time world champion who knows I, I, th I think it's really cool that, you know, for you guys to be running this promotion together because the, when you look at just like the combined amount of experience that the both of you have and the, the levels of success that both of you have reached, like, I, I think that's like, that's a really, really cool thing. And, and it's a great thing for your students as well to be able to have both sides and you can go to either one and get that great wealth of knowledge from the both of you. So I think that's a, you know, it's a d d double sided coin type thing where you can get good on either side. So I think that's, you know, that's real cool. Like one one thing I did want to talk to you about, like so you 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 were you have been very open about the injuries that have tallied up over the years, and you know have kind of you know led to you stepping away as a full time in ring performer. But like, so when you see like just the advancements in technology and the advancements in medicines that we have, and we and you see like a 
like a like a Tomiaki Homer who recently came back to New Japan after suffering a severe neck injury and you look at it, the the Daniel Bryans and the editors of the world. Like, do, do you ever like have those feelings? Not necessarily like I'm gonna come back full time and mm -hmm. I'm gonna tear it up, but like more so like, you know, may, maybe one of these days, you know, like maybe, maybe one of these days. I was involved in a six man tag team. What is the date today actually? What is it? It's, uh, We're recording uh, this September on the 12th. 12th. Yeah. Uh, on the 14th of September last, last year, year right? I was yeah. involved in a six man tag team match. Um, if you go back and watch it, you'll realize I didn't take any bumps or anything like that. Okay. I was kind of the one dishing out most of the punishment. So I did it in a safe manner. Um, so I was able to kind of get that one last hurrah as a baby face where the crowd gave me a standing ovation. We were oh, in a really lo large venue with a whole lot of people there. Uh, Alex Shelley was on the show. He's a longtime friend. Um, so it was, or excuse me, he wasn't on that one, my mistake. Uh, but it, it was an awesome opportunity to, to, and again, that was a moment where I was like, this may never happen again. So I took a step back once again, I, I soaked it all in and I realized, you know, how special of a moment it was. And, and I, I do miss performing all the time. You know, all my life I've been a performer, even before getting into professional wrestling i was in theater growing up in middle school and high school uh, i played sports uh high school football and that's really big in our area so in a way that was performing as well um you know since being involved in professional wrestling i've done television i've done movies uh i've been a part of wwe productions on raw and smackdown and, and a wrestlemania which was super cool so like my whole life i've just been a performer so now I'm not so much of a performer. Now I'm behind the scenes and I'm, I'm giving other people ideas and, and I'm writing promos for somebody else if they need help with that. Um, and I'm coming up with storylines and ideas for, for feuds and matches that have nothing to do with me other than the fact that I promote them. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely a part of me that misses performing, but unfortunately it's just too dangerous for me at this moment. When I had my, my fusion, it was, uh, a C5 through C7. So that covers two vertebrae. They put a screw in the top. They put a screw in the bottom. And then when they went to put a screw in the middle to make it a nice strong plate on my spine, uh, I was hooked up to all these like neural sensors and whatnot since I was passed out and I wouldn't be able to tell them what hurt and what didn't. But every time they would go to put the third screw in, it would separate my vertebrae uh, just a little too much and it would actually cause my entire body to seize uh, on the operating table. So after trying that a handful of times, they just realized it wasn't possible. So they had to leave that third screw out. So I have a top screw and I have a bottom screw, but I don't have a middle screw, which means all the pressure from the strong part at the top and the strong part at the bottom goes to the middle where there is no screw, it was dispersed to the middle. So that actually makes it quite weak in the middle. So I really wouldn't be cleared to bump again. I wouldn't be cleared. I'm not even, I'm cleared to lift again, but with restrictions to where if I ever feel like a, a little bit of pain in the neck or a little bit of discomfort in the neck, I'm supposed to stop immediately. And unfortunately, every time I go to lift, I get that pain in my neck and, and I do have to, mm. to stop what I'm doing. So I can't really stay in the physical shape that I need to be uh, to be a performer at the level that I would expect from myself. Um, and I wouldn't be able to go in the ring and do these epic 30 minute one on one main right. event style matches and these big blow off feuds that I'm so used to doing and that people would expect of me. So at this point, uh, it doesn't feel like it's something um, that I'll be able to come back to in my future. I, I'm not going to sit here and say I never will. I'm not going to sit here and say I'm retired for the rest of my life because there's always an opportunity within the right storyline uh, as long as it's safe and we can kind of structure it safely. There's always an opportunity for something right, something like that. But as of right now, I'd say it's pretty unlikely. Right, right. And, and, and you know, you mentioned like just holding yourself to a certain standard as far as like what you would want to go out there and do if that was a possibility. Like, I think that's that's cool to hear just knowing the level that you would want to perform at. and even just giving the people that would be watching, you would want to give them like 100% of yourself and not go out there and kind of like, not, 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 not even like, I don't think half ass the word, but like not give them what you know you could give them. You know what I'm saying? I, I think that's a, that's a really cool thing. Yeah, I, I think I set a standard for myself, uh, especially for the people in, 
the fans of SCW, the fans of Iowa Independent Wrestling, Midwest Independent Wrestling, I think they knew that if they paid money to see a Merrick Brave match, they knew they were going to get somebody who was performing at the, the top level of uh, Midwest Independence. And uh, I would hate to have somebody pay their hard-earned money to come see me wrestle again and have them walk away disappointed. Right. Um, not to say they would, because there, like I said, there are other things I can do and ways to work around it uh, to still make it a very entertaining match. Um, but that would be kind of the worst feeling to me is if somebody paid their money and walked away disappointed. So uh, at this point, like I said, pretty unlikely that I'll, I'll return specifically to uh, kind of a every day, every weekend type role, but maybe a one-off here or there as we go into the future. I'm still only 34 years old. So. Oh, wow. Okay. There's you, you, you a young dude, man. You a young dude, man. I was, you know, I'm, I'm 20. I just turned 24 last month. So like, oh. you, 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 <laughs> you, you, you a young dude, man. I was, I was like, it's, it, you got years, years left to go, man. But like, uh, like I did want to ask, like, do you kind of, do you feel like you kind of get that creative fulfillment from, you know, booking and, and creating these stories and then seeing it play out? Does, does that kind of like feel that void just, just, just maybe just a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's not quite the same, you know, it's not the same right, as performing. Right, right. I do miss performing. Uh, but people always ask me, do you miss pro wrestling? And I'm like, there's, how could I possibly miss pro You're wrestling? Still, still I, in pro wrestling. I haven't been around. <laughs> I haven't been gone from pro wrestling. Right. I'm, I'm around it every day at training. And then I'm around it on the weekends when I put on my shows. And then, you know, on my off days, I have students sending me matches to watch and, there's wrestling on TV every single night of the week now. So I can't miss pro wrestling. I'm still quite involved in pro wrestling. Um, but I definitely do miss the performing aspect of it. But there is a creative outlet um, coming up with the storylines, helping people put their matches together, helping people put their promos together and whatnot, giving people ideas for characters and different things. And so there is definitely still a bit of a creative outlet doing that. You know, and going back to the the early two thousands, man, like the the talent pool that you were a part of, man, like is it, ridiculous. Like talent wise, like Cesaro, Ricochet, um, Nigel McGuinness, Eric Young, like and of course Seth Rollins. Not to mention him, like dude, like the the talent Jimmy that Jacobs, was. Jimmy Jacobs, Alex Shelley, Chris, <laughs> Chris Saban, Chris Hero. Uh, yeah, Chris. It, yeah. it goes on and on and on. Matt Seidel, Chuck right. Taylor. It's just uh, you you can't stop because there's so many good guys. And then those are just the young guys coming up. That's not even including some of the guys that were older that were passing down knowledge to us. Like Jerry Lynn is one of the most fantastic wrestlers I've ever been in the ring with. And, uh, you know, I got to wrestle him multiple times, including a, a feud in AAW where I lost the heavyweight title to him. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's still a great dude. Uh, he was – Talking to Ben Ben Carter about me when when Ben yeah. was doing his AEW dark stuff and he was he was uh, telling him to say hi and everything and and when we have WrestleCon and things like that we always try to catch up so yeah man the early two thousands indies were were unmatched and I get nostalgic <laughs> yeah and I mean at the Colt Cabana CM Punk yeah, Ace yeah, Hill, yeah, all of yeah, those man, guys that's are crazy man all of those guys are from my area you know they're from Chicago so I used to go and watch them wrestle when I was 16 years old on indie shows in front of 50 people. Cause indie wrestling wasn't, you know, despite having quality talent, like we've mentioned, it wasn't the hot ticket in town to go to indie wrestling. So I saw CM Punk wrestle AJ Styles five minutes from my house in Rock Island, Illinois, right across the river, right across the Mississippi river from Iowa. I saw them wrestle AJ Styles versus CM Punk main event of a indie show, uh, 15, 20 minutes. And, it was five minutes from my house and there was probably 40 people in attendance. So if you put AJ Styles versus CM Punk on any <laughs> show in the world, in any arena in the world, that's, selling out. Today, that's a sellout. Yeah. You sell a hundred thousand <laughs> tickets for that. And I saw it happen yeah. in front of 40 people. Yeah. Hundred percent, man. Like that, that, that talent pool that you guys were a part of was just in, insane. It is so many people that you know, we didn't even mention you got guys like Samoa Joe, like a low key, a Brian Danielson, like it is, Oh my goodness, man! Like it's, it's crazy. But like one guy that I did kind of, kind of did want to talk to you about just a little bit was was Nigel McGuinness, and like just seeing how his career kind of panned out, and like now he's the transition to the commentary desk, and not like I, I don't know why, but people think Nigel was like this, this like older guy. I'm like Nigel was probably like 40, 40 in his forties. Like Nigel was yeah. old at all. But like just seeing how his career kind of turned out, and now him transitioning to that, 
and like knowing what he put his body through because Nigel was very very physical in the ring and like you see yep. some of the clips going around of like him versus uh daniel bryan and bryan sort of like pulling him to the uh the steel post and it, like nigel not protecting his head at all like yeah. just <laughs> like head first into the like just seeing just seeing that stuff and then seeing how you know how things like that today wouldn't necessarily be i don't want to say tolerated but like they wouldn't be looked found up like they, they they just wouldn't look, look, look positively upon like the, the change in professional wrestling has like just greatly improved like with with stuff like which you can like stuff like that when you can't you but essentially you can't do stuff like that anymore but you can right. but i mean like it's like it's not really you know look looked look, look upon greatly like that sure yeah no nigel was a great dude i got to work with him one time unfortunately i was actually uh pretty severely injured at the time i had uh, an injury to my lower back and I had to get all taped up and everything. And I felt terrible because, you know, he's Nigel McGuinness. At that time I was still, uh, you know, an up and coming uh, performer. So I was very much looking forward to, to wrestling him. Uh, I injured myself, not even in a, in a ring, but kind of horsing around before a show the night before. Um, and I didn't, want to pull out of the match i still want an opportunity to work with him but as we were putting the match together he had so many different ideas for things that would have been fantastic but unfortunately i was unable to do half of them because of the state of my back at the time and i could tell he was frustrated um as anyone would be because he right. wanted i think that was his debut in aaw at the time and he wanted to come in and make a good impression despite the fact that everybody already loved him mm. but uh you know, so he was a little disappointed, and I apologize profusely, but he was great uh, to work with, and he was a cool dude, uh, and he's had a storied career. He was always one of the guys that I loved watching and studying as I was coming up, and, and to see him be able to carve out his own little place in, uh, you know, the wrestling business outside of being an in-ring performer, yeah. mm -hmm. that's great, and I always tell people that. I'm like, listen, man, like, Everybody wants to be a wrestler, but if you if you can't make it as a wrestler, not to say Nigel didn't make it as a wrestler. Right, I, I know what you're saying. Did, yeah. You know, but, you know, let's just say a trainee comes through and after six weeks they decide, man, I don't think I'm going to make it as a wrestler. That's okay. It's not meant for everybody. If, if, if it was easy and every single person could be a pro wrestler, then we'd have a million pro <laughs> wrestlers uh, on the independent level instead of the – half a million that we have now and mm -hmm. I don't know any but uh you know there's always room for intelligent hard-working passionate people in the business whether that's somebody who's taking money at the door or working the merch table or you're a referee a, a commentator a ring announcer whatever it may be if you're an intelligent hard-working passionate person there's room for you in the professional wrestling business so uh I always encourage people to, to stick it out, uh, you know, find a different app. You know, my dream when I was 18 years old wasn't to be the head trainer at right. uh, a professional wrestling school, right? <laughs> right? But I make a living doing that. I don't have to have another job. That's all I do. I'm very lucky, very blessed to be in that position. But dreams diverge a little bit. Sometimes you're, you're on this path. And there's a fork in the road and you can't go straight anymore. You have to choose left or right, but don't be afraid to, to, to make that decision. Don't be afraid to, to go left or to go right and to change the, the way that you ultimately uh, end up in, in whatever avenue in life that you're, you're choosing to pursue. Uh, don't be afraid to, to change the end result uh, as far as, you know, exactly what you want to do. I wanted to be a world famous professional wrestler making a living off of pro wrestling. And I didn't get to do that as an in-ring performer, but the end result was the same. I did make a living. I did end up making a living off of pro wrestling. So don't be afraid to, to pivot and try new things and, and to work hard in different avenues to still make your dreams come true. Cause there's more than one path in life for every. Yeah, that's, that's some sound advice right there. I'm gonna take, take take that in myself, man. But like, well, let, let's be before we wrap it up here. I did want to ask you one one last question. I'm gonna put you on the spot right here. Starbucks or three nine two deep pool coffee? Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you do that to me? 
I don't even know how you know that. Okay, man, I got to be honest. Starbucks. Oh! <laughs> I got to be honest. Uh, 392 is good. Don't get me wrong. Oh, but, I, but their hours don't really work for me. <laughs> I don't live super close. It's right next door to our, our, our wrestling academy, and we don't start training until 6 p.m. at night, but they close at 5 o'clock. Plus, I'm an old man. I don't drink caffeine being that late in the evening or else I'll be up till four o'clock in the morning banging my head against the wall and you know what I don't care if people talk crap about Starbucks I think it's delicious and I just even their black coffee I just oh, like the way goodness. it tastes so I don't know if he'll end up watching this but I'm sure everybody's gonna tag him in this after this after they see this but um, sorry Steph I like Starbucks better Meg, I, I, I'll that's a bit. great that's probably the best question i've ever gotten in one of these interviews you did your homework man that's great Meg, Meg, i don't want to do it to you man but i might have to isolate that clip and i might do, i might have to i might have to, might have to put that out there man because that's, that's great fine, that's fine. And, and i also read up that you're uh you're a miami dolphins fan is that huge correct? dolphins fan oh, who's the, I'm, I'm i'm praying for your stress levels this season man I, 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 <laughs> well i mean so last year I went into it knowing they were going to be terrible, and right. they actually surprised me. They weren't as bad yeah, yeah. Uh, as people predicted them to be, but that pissed me off because I was like, man, lose these games and get this number one overall <laughs> draft pick because at the time I wanted to draft Tua really badly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Burrow comes along, and he has a fantastic season. I think he's going to be a great quarterback, but I still wanted Tua. And mm -hmm. so I was like, man, we're going to win in too many games. We're not going to be able to get Tua. And then suddenly it all – works out and they didn't have to move up from number five they were able to let the board fall to them uh they drafted Tua they had two more first round draft picks they were able to fill out left tackle and and get a, a nickel cornerback late in the first round they got two first round picks next year two second round picks next year the Dolphins are coming man they haven't been good since I was in my freshman year in high school uh and then Dan Marino retired he's my favorite football player of all time obviously any Dolphins fan will probably tell you that. Yeah. But uh, they got Tua, and he's the future, and I'm a big believer in Tua, and, and I just need some some good luck here because it's been a rough 20 years watching Tom Brady and the Patriots stomp us every season. But Tom's gone. Yeah. The Patriots aren't going to be as good. The Dolphins got Tua. I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah. I need a Super Bowl championship really there bad. It is. There it is. And I, I think one of the, probably one of the biggest – uh, criticism of, of, of Tua's game is, you know, of course, the injuries that people now sure. think that that's why people kind of passed up on him. But I think, I think, I, honestly, I think that's going to end up motivating him in the end, knowing that so many teams kind of, you know, let him go to the wayside just a little bit. Those teams mm -hmm. that were remaining kind of let him go fast. So I think that's going to motivate him a lot. He going, he, I think he going, I think he going to surprise a lot of people this year. It's a physical game. You're going to get hurt yeah, playing yeah. football, you know, and everybody gets one of those injuries. You know what I mean? Tom Brady tore his ACL and then came back. And won a handful more Super Bowls and set records and everything. So everybody suffers a major injury at some point. Hopefully, Tua's was in college and he'll have a nice, healthy career going forward. But his, they say his medicals are clean now. Uh, so as long as he can learn to slide instead of getting tackled by those 350-pound D tackles, then then he'll be all right. All right, right, right. So, Matt, Matt, Merrick, man, I did want to thank you for your time, man. This was this was a good time. I really enjoyed this interview, man. Like, any uh, final plug that you want to get in, the floor is yours. Uh, you know, get it, get it all out. Sure. Like I said, I run an independent promotion. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at SCW Pro. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I do not have a Facebook. I've never had a Facebook <laughs> in my entire life. So, that's one thing I'm going to – hold firm to but you can follow me on twitter and instagram at mbrave13 and you can follow black and brave on twitter at black and brave and black and brave on instagram at black and brave wrestling so those yeah. those are where you'll find me there it is folks there it is ladies and gentlemen i'm andrew thompson of the andrew thompson interviews youtube channel this is the one and only merrick brave and we are out thank you for watching peace thanks for having me andrew <laughs>